Animators tend to construct a closed world for themselves, like pigeon fanciers or rabbit breeders. I never call myself an animated filmmaker, because I'm interested not in animation techniques or creating a complete illusion, but in bringing life to everyday objects. Surrealism exists in reality, not beside it. I've never considered myself just an animated filmmaker. I accept it as one of many forms of expression. If I'm not making films, I can devote my energies to writing, or to my tactile experiments, or my ceramics or collage. Imagination, which is born in childhood, remains constant. Now, although people are capable of existing in many times at once, most adults cast off their childhood as if it's just a preparation for what follows, or they sentimentalize it as some sort of golden age. I prefer to conduct an active dialogue with my childhood. If I had to identify one film which I think of as more subjective and autobiographical than the others, then that film would be Down to the Cellar.
childhood and dreams are the basic constants in my work, a return to my childhood and to my dreams. I believe every artist derives his work from these sources because they're his strongest experiences. I wouldn't consider them to be some special feature confined just to my work. Adults have a very distorted idea of a child's world. Children are more animalistic than we care to admit. The principle of desire lives on in a child who still hasn't been domesticated by the world. Its imagination is that much freer. The vision of childhood as a paradise lost is certainly a distortion. From the start, our entry into the world is probably an unpleasant experience. Afterwards, childhood itself is full of constraints, injustices and cruelty. No one knows better than a child how to be cruel. It was brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borrow goves, and the mome raths outgrabe. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jubjub bird, and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the manxome foe he sought. So rested he by the tum-tum tree, and stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the talgy wood, and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through, the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. Oh, frabjous day, kaloo, kalay, he chortled in his joy. T'was brillig. And the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borrow goves, and the mome rats outgrabe.
animated film is pure magic for me. But like all surrealists, art for me exists in many forms. I was born in Prague, which is deeply encoded in me. I live in a special kind of Prague, a city of magic, alchemy, and hermetics. It is the Prague of Rudolf II. As I see it, the mannerism of Rudolf's times left an indelible mark on Czechoslovakia, especially in Prague. And when I talk about mannerism, I have in mind, first and foremost, Giuseppe Archimboldo. In several films, you'll find references to his paintings of faces whose features are made from things or animals. Like Archimboldo, the desire to create transformations is very strong in me. Like Rudolf II, I also am a collector. All my life, I've been collecting things. My collecting is extremely selective and does not allow itself to be governed by the value of the objects themselves, but by how they work on me. Sometimes, certain objects stimulate my interest and I just start collecting. Then something begins to work in my mind, and usually a film grows out of it. What interests me about an object or a cinematic setting is not its artistic eloquence, but what it's made of, what affects it, and in what circumstances it's affected, and also how it's altered by time. This explains why, from my earliest films on, I've used the close-up, which precisely searches out every last scratch on the illusion. For me, objects are more alive than people, more permanent and more expressive. The memories they possess far exceed the memories of man. Objects conceal within themselves the events they've witnessed. That's why I surround myself with them and try to uncover those hidden events and experiences. And that relates to my belief that objects have their own passive lives, which they've soaked up, as it were, from the situations they've been in and from the people who have made them and touched them and lived with them. All that remains is to find the key that will make them talk. And it is this key which I am always looking for. In my opinion, this should be the purpose of any animation, to let objects speak for themselves. So I don't actually animate objects, I coerce their inner life out of them. And for that, animation is a great aid which I consider to be a sort of magical rite or ritual. The purpose of my films would appear to be a modest one, to draw attention once again to dreams. But dreams are no longer valued in contemporary civilization. They've been cast aside onto the rubbish dump of our psyches. Dream and reality are the communicating vessels of our lives. Dream is life, which added to the rest of our life creates what we call human existence. Unless we begin again to tell fairy tales and ghost stories at night before going to sleep and to recount our dreams upon waking, then nothing more is to be expected of our Western civilization. It is one of the superiorities of man that he dreams and knows it. We've hardly made the right use of this yet. The artworks of Jan Schwankmeyer shown in this program are featured in an exhibition, The Communication of Dreams, which opens at Chapter Arts Centre Cardiff on Thursday the 12th of March and runs until the 5th of April.
In the old magician's books, they say that if we wish to exorcise a demon or a ghost, then we need to give him a name, find a name for him. And I think that is precisely the method that I use to get rid of my anxieties and fears. I give them a name in my films. I'm not interested in animated film as such. I'm only interested in its technique as a means for my self-expression. If I were to find a common denominator for all my films, it would be the attempt to get rid of anxiety and fear. And the battle against these feelings is probably the basic theme of my films. <laughs> The theme of the unquiet house is close to home for me as I live in such a house in the Prague Castle area. Some houses and some streets are full of stories that I try to incorporate through analogy into my films. In this sense, I have many unique experiences. The practical joke for me is another wonderfully rich means of expression. It includes acts of aggression, sarcasm, and later, a release of accumulated tension. I think my work goes more and more from being a pure game to being an attempt to achieve release from fear and anxiety, both internal and external, even if the progress goes in fits and starts. My weapons are sarcasm, irony, and black humor.
humor is a weapon. You can use it for both defense and attack. If there's anything special about Czech humor, it's the fact that it's used more for defense than to attack. Czech humor's a bit more skeptical than the humor of other nations. It's a defense mechanism against the fraudulence of the outside world, a counterattack using the same weapons that society itself uses most effectively to manipulate us. Animation enables me to give magical powers to things, a certain magical impact. In my films, I move mainly objects, real objects. Suddenly, everyday contact with things which people are used to acquires a new dimension, and in this way, casts doubt over reality. In other words, I use animation as a means of subversion. Leonardo's diary is based on the principle of chance encounters between two historical periods. In the 70s, many of my films were only allowed to be screened because they were originally conceived as films for children or as cultural documents. Leonardo's diary was, on the face of it, an animated journey through his sketchbooks, with no more in mind than the idea of demonstrating the available wealth of animated techniques. But somehow, the contemporary situation imposed itself during the shoot, so that during the editing, analogies drawn from contemporary life would suddenly come to me. So I included some newsreels, and reality itself invaded the finished film. This easy-going approach to the way a film changes during production was certainly very different from the dominant practice. So it's not really very surprising that all the films I made this way ran into great difficulty once they were completed. This does not mean that I was deliberately deceiving my superiors. My films contained many meanings. They were not made just to interpret the era I'm living in. One has to stay oneself, and to create authentic artworks, one has to take as their basis the things one has lived through. One cannot make them up. Even when one makes so-called imaginative works, even when one uses symbols, one cannot simply throw a part of oneself away. It is, in fact, on account of Leonardo's diary that I was unable to make films for several years. From 1973 to 1981, I was forced to rest from the cinema, and I devoted my time to other forms of creative activity. As a child during the war, I used to be repeatedly chased by foreign soldiers in my dreams. I would flee from them across the courtyards and the blocks of houses where we lived. And the next morning, from the balcony of the third floor overlooking the courtyard, I would review my nocturnal dreamlike escape and invent new strategies of evasion for my next dream. Thus equipped, I was able to await my next harrowing dream calmly with the realistic hope that this time I would succeed in escaping. I always express myself through metaphors or metamorphosis, never through direct political action, and I think I will continue to do so. It has a wider appeal. It opens up the possibility of multiple interpretation, and I think that it also captures the essence of both political and social issues better than, for example, a direct political document. Dimensions of Dialogue is a purely ideological film. 
Although the political side of it is expressed in certain symbols, it's nevertheless clearly comprehensible to anybody who lived through that era. At one time, even the communist establishment was able to recognize these symbols, and that was why the film was banned. <laughs>
For me, what matters is the strength of the reserves that I carry within myself. The means of expression are interchangeable. I seek a universality of expression. In this sense, my attitude is that of a militant surrealist. Surrealism never evaded direct political action. It was always committed to political action, especially against Stalinism. This film is a kind of catharsis. I wanted to get rid of the tension accumulated in me during the 40 years of my life under Stalinism.
Of course, Stalinism in Czechoslovakia has lost its political power now, but I don't think I'm just flogging a dead horse. One can hardly rid oneself of Stalinism just by rattling one's keys and putting a Czech trickler on one's coat. Stalinism appeals to the lowest instincts of man, and that always suits at least a certain part of the nation. The Czech nation has one advantage. It went through a developed liberal democracy between the wars, then through fascism, and then through Stalinism. One would hope that in its future course, it would avoid the faults of all these three systems and that it would create something new. But I'm afraid our people are not patient enough to try out a new system, and we'll end up with some primitive form of capitalism. In that case, my works will continue to oppose the establishment. There's no manual on how to look at my work. My films have several meanings, and I'd rather they inspired the viewer to use his own subjective symbolism to interpret them. Just as in psychoanalysis, there must always be secrecy. Without secrecy, there is no art. The artwork of Jan Schwankmeyer shown in this program is featured in an exhibition at the Chapter Art Centre in Cardiff, which runs until the 5th of April.